All right. You're live. We are live. As Brent Musburger used to say, you're looking live at the Williston United Methodist Church. Welcome to the new year, and we're thankful to be back studying as we're continuing on the study of the seven churches of Revelation. Hopefully we'll have a good year, a good study, and hopefully some more people that are following along will get up a little earlier and come to Sunday school. Or we could always flip it around like they did at North River. The Sunday school was first, the service was later, and then it's more was I mean, straight to reverse. So we'll have to try it sometime and <clears throat> see how many people will come to worship service at 10 and come to Sunday school at 11. Hey, I better leave well enough. Amen. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> always picking and throwing stuff around. That's the fault in me, I guess. So, as this is, I believe, lesson seven, as we are. Um, on the half circle coming on the other side of the church at Sardis, S-A-R-D-I-S. And I'll open this with a prayer and we'll get started on that. Father, we thank you for the ability to be able to come and take your word out. And as we stand on the threshold of the 2022, may we walk through the open doors and bring us here in Williston to minister and teach others who need to hear what you have to say. May our our church be blessed. May you bring new people in. May you bring the old people that haven't been here back. May you lead us through the open door, as we said, to tell others about your word. And may everything we say and do, not only today, in Sunday school and service, but this whole year, draw us closer to you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We are in chapter 3. We've moved out of chapter 2 into chapter 3. <clears throat> as I said, this is the fifth of the seven churches as we would have started at the lower left-hand corner. The first church we'd have come to, at the letters that John was writing to the seven churches would have come to Ephesus. And then certainly the church who had lost its first love, and then we would have come to the church at Smyrna, a little bit north or east of that would have been the church at Smyrna who was being persecuted, but nothing negative said about them. Then we'd have come a little bit further north to the church at Pergamos, who was the tolerant church, and then maybe over towards the western a little bit, we would have come to the church at Thyatira, the church who was tolerating evil. And now as we come a little bit further down south to the church at Sardis. Let me read that. <clears throat> and to the angel of the church in Sardis, write, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is, and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come against you. Yet you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And that's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks. Thanks. And certainly may God bless the reading and hopefully the exposition of the word. The city of Sardis was considered one of the most impregnable cities of the day. History buffs like the story of this. And I'd never heard of the guy who was king there, but some of you may have. The city of Sardis was situated some 1,500 feet above the valley floor on the top of a mountain spur, surrounded by sheer cliffs on three sides and then a narrow isthmus on the fourth side that allowed access to it. The greatest king of Sardis was a man by the name of Croesus. And there was a saying that went about that if you compared somebody like we do, as rich as Croesus. I never heard that saying. You heard that saying? Uh, history buffs tell us he was one of the wealth, most wealthy members of the Sardinian area and during that time period. So during that time, you know, we say it's as hot as the devil or as you know, bright as light. They confer, compared everybody as we do to Croesus. He was a very wealthy man. Unfortunately, it was his over, overconfidence and his security in the wealth and of the city that really caused his downfall. Now, Croesus, against better advice, went to war against a guy that we know from history, King Cyrus, the king of Persia. 
Now, we're going to see a little bit of Medes and Persians in the future when we study Esther. But uh, Cyrus was the king of them at that time. And at the, at the well organized, I think it was the Oracle of Delphi, was at, went to see, Croesus did, well, should I attack this man? And the word that came back is, is if you attack this city, a great empire will be destroyed. Well, Croesus devised where he lived and his money decided he would take the battle against Cyrus and ultimately was defeated. Defeated mainly because he felt confidence in the city. You see, Cyrus had offered a reward to any one of the soldiers who could figure out a way into this fortress of Cyrus. Remember, there's only one way in. Now, there's three cliffs on each side, just just one way in, so they felt pretty good they could defend it. Well, by chance, one night, a Persian soldier noticed one of the Sardinian soldiers was on the top, and he dropped his helmet accidentally over the city wall. When the Sardinian appeared briefly a few minutes later down at the bottom of the wall to retrieve the helmet, the Persian guy knew there was another way into the city through a passageway. Well, under cover of darkness, the Persian raiding party led well, the Persian guy and led a raiding party who went right into the city. They found there was no guard. They were so confident in their strength and they let their force down that the Sardinians were completely defeated by the Persians mainly by fact of overconfidence. I'm telling this history story because this is sort of what had happened to the church here that Jesus is getting ready to address. It was nearly a century later in almost the same way that the Sardinians were defeated a second time by being overconfident in their city. And certainly so twice in history, the city of Sardinia was destroyed because of overconfidence. But as I said, I told us all that because certainly that idea of overconfidence had kind of infiltrated the church here at Sardinia. The fifth letter that John writes is to this church. Now, history tells us there were some important figures who were living in this area. One of the Greek philosophers, for those who studied philosophy in school, by the name of Thales, I think I'm saying that right, T-H-A-L-E-S, was from this area. And one of the great Athenian legislators named Solon was there. So people wealthy people, important people of the day lived in this great city. One of the things that the city was well noted for was mining gold and silver coins. So they were wealthy and pretty much felt impenetrable and indestructible based upon who they were. But history tells us more than anything, the city is well noted for the two times in history that it was defeated by being overconfident. <clears throat> well, the Lord introduces himself to the king or to the pastor of this church in a designation, as we've always seen, that really fit the church. We've seen the eyes of fire, the flames, uh, a hair of wool, white hair, the bronze feet. Now Jesus begins introducing himself. These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Back from that vision in chapter 1. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we had talked about the Holy Spirit and how it's illustrated the seven spirits and knowledge and wisdom and I can't remember the other ones off the top of my head, but all the ways that the Holy Spirit fills itself out in people today. And he had a sevenfold ministry. So the Holy Spirit was active <clears throat> in all the seven churches in which the Lord wrote the letters, and they were here too. And Jesus makes reference that he is the one who has the Holy Spirit and <clears throat> is, is make, addressing that to the pastor of this church. So in effect, Jesus is saying to the church at Sardis, I am the one who has the Holy Spirit who brings life to you and is in control not only you, but the pastor of the church. And so he needs to breathe some life into the church that we see here. But unlike the previous churches that we've seen, this letter goes right to the heart of being a denunciation of the church, whereas some of the other churches, well, you're document, you're doctrinally sound, you're very helpful, you do all these good things, but here he comes right out of the bat and begins to talk in a negative manner toward him, as you have a name that you're alive, but you are dead. <clears throat> so a couple of things that the Lord denounces this early church, as we said, this is not only for that church, Churches today, Christians today, and of course we'll talk about the time period that it references to, is this church, and certainly churches today, is denounced for its outward profession, but its inward deadness. Uh, Sardis may have been the birthplace of what today, if uh, 
Pastor Bob or Paul was here would say they learned in divinity school as nominal Christians. A person who is a Christian in name only. They say they're Christians, but don't act like it, don't live like it, don't do anything like it. The church at Sardis had become more of what we call a mausoleum than a church. It was a well-kept place with dead man's bones, as Jesus would refer earlier to the Pharisees. Now, nominal belief is certainly critiqued quite often in Scripture. <clears throat> Going back to the Old Testament, good old Isaiah uh, spoke for the Lord on one occasion when he pointed out in chapter 29, 13, that my people draw near me with their mouths and lips, but their hearts are far from me. We all know people who say, well, you know, I, I'm a Christian. And I, I go to Sunday school. I go to church. I do all these things, but never act or do outside of that act anything more like the Word of God. They know anything about the Word of God or the Christ or anything about it. That's what we're talking about, the nominal Christians here. On the outside, they looked great. They spoke the, what was it um, John MacArthur said, Christianese. <laughs> they know the right words to say, but in reality, their heart is not in the condition it needs to be. Jesus spoke to the Pharisees about that. <clears throat> Certainly, Audrey had quite read, read reached that point in Thursday night, but we will reach that way in a couple of weeks. In chapter 23, when Jesus began to talk about calling them whitewashed sepulchres, he says they were like hypocrites on the outside. They were beautiful. They painted the outside of those uh, tombs white and beautiful, but inside it was full of nothing but dead, deadness. So certainly, Jesus says that's the problem with the church here in Sardis. Outside it was a beautiful, probably a beautiful sanctuary, service, everything, but inward. It was just completely dead, full of dead men and bows. And this church, Jesus denounces for them and says that they are dead on the inside. Not only that, but they were incomplete in the works. He, he, other churches, he had said, you know, I know your works and you've been doing this, you've been doing that. Here he says, I've not found your works perfect before God. Now I learned a long time ago when I first started reading the Bible, you would see the word perfect. It doesn't mean perfect the way that we say, oh, well, she's perfect. It means complete, finished, the way it should be. The Christians in Sardis were physically alive, but spiritually dead and were not doing the things that the Lord had called them to do. I love the quote here. He said it was a lot like religion that never got past the infant stage. Maybe they had, you know, given their life to the Lord, but never grown anything past it. As Paul would say, they were still drinking milk and not eating steak. <laughs> John Stott, in his commentary on the... I realize that really John Stott made a commentary that's only on uh, the first set of the seven churches. And every time I think of Stott, Stott I think of uh, Sherry and uh, Kevin Stott. So that's the only guy I know his last name is Stott. They made me relate on how to ask him sometime. He says, We as a church have a fine choir. We have an expensive organ, plenty of food, great music, great anthems, and fine congregational singing. We can mouth hymns and psalms with unimpeachable elegance. While our mind wanders and our heart is far from God, we can have great pomp and ceremony, color and ritual, liturgical exactness, and an ecclesiastical splendor, and yet the offering of worship which is not perfect or complete or fulfilled in the sight of God. Certainly, that is the denunciation that the Lord is bringing <clears throat> to this church and said we're not used to seeing some negativity right off the bat to the church the Lord usually had some good things to say but not to this church well as always when you go to the doctor and he says well you've been diagnosed with this and that you say well, all right, well what can we do about it right give me some give me some something to handle this so here's what the Lord gives some direction to it as he always has there were three groups of people who were in the church at Sardis there was a group the people who had never given their life to the Lord, they were the unsaved. Then there was a group of what we call carnal Christians, that <clears throat> preachers like to talk about, who acted like they were unsaved, and then a remnant of Christians who were there, who loved the Lord, and were the faithful, trying to make the church to be what it was supposed to be. And so Jesus is certainly writing this to the whole, but certainly has some uh, information for all three of these. First of all, he begins to tell them to be vigilant. He says to the church, you are, re are almost ready to lose everything you have. In my eyes, quote, as the commentary says, in my eyes I've already seen that you're dead, but there's a little left there. 
And you're going to lose that if you don't wake up and get diligent. Paul would later write to the Ephesians, in Ephesians 5, something very similar, <clears throat> when he said, Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead. So Paul, not only Paul, but the Lord here is telling us, you know, there are some of you that are alive. Wake up for those that are acting like they're dead. And straighten up. We don't want the church to completely die and go away. And he says, so keep the focus on the truth. Keep doing the spiritual things that you need to be and be diligent so the church can come to life. <clears throat> so not only to be diligent, they were to be vigorous. To the true believers in the church, he says, continue to be vigorous and strengthen those who need it in the church. At Sardis, John, the Lord writes, there were a quote a few who had not defiled their garments. And he said, I want those to be strengthened and build up. And of course, I'm going to quote, and I love what Dr. Jeremiah here, because it reminds me of some of the churches growing up in. He says, I've met many people who attended small churches where perhaps generations of their family have attended. And they struggle along with a handful of others to keep the church alive through small studies, through groups to get together, whatever they can do to keep everything going. However, the church sort of seemed to be that way. God said, throughout history, He has always kept a remnant in large churches, small churches, and a few that keep the light going and keep the church moving. And I can say that sounds like so familiar with. He says, be village, be vigorous, and be victorious. Because He says, don't, we don't want the church to die. And what is church death? Physical death is the separation of the spirit from the body. And the commentary goes talking about the same that happened to a church. When the Spirit of God leaves the body of the church, the church can begin to die. And Jesus tells this church, I want you to remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. That's a veiled reference to what he said he was holding. The Spirit. He says, remember the Spirit that bought the church alive. When the church was born, that set the church in motion. He says, remember that. Just like individuals, when we're born again, the Spirit of God comes and lives within us. When a church is born, the Spirit comes into the church. And he goes into great detail in two of the commentaries that talked about that. Really, churches are the church is not the building. The church are all of us who are here. And when the Spirit leaves the people, the Spirit leaves the church. And so Jesus is saying to you as individuals, there, remember the Spirit. Bring the Spirit to the degree that the Spirit never leaves the church. Or the Spirit to the decree that the church never invites the Spirit into individuals is how the church begins to falter and die. And Jesus says to this church, be vigilant, be vigorous, be victorious. Remember, I have the Spirit. Receive the Spirit back into the church. And then He says, for those who are here, hold fast and become vibrant. That's a, usually when you see somebody holding fast, it's holding fast to a doctrine or some kind of belief. So Jesus says to this church, if you have any hope, church, as living, hold fast to the truth, what you were developed from, the Spirit, the truth, and everything, and you will continue to live. And then ultimately, he says, be virtuous, as we've seen in all of the seven, well, all the churches except for Smyrna, who didn't need it. He gives that same, that same command is repent. Remember, it was repeat, repent, repeat, and return. Here we are again, repenting and returning to restore the virtue there, there. Because there was only a few here in this church who had not defiled their garments. Jesus says, continue to keep everything the way you need to be. Repent and return and let the Spirit be guided back into your life. Well, to those who hold out, once again, He gives some several promises. In verse 5, He says, to those who are overcoming, and we said to the overcomers, they are those who hold out till the end. He says they would be clothed in white. Now, being clothed in white signifies one of the things that we learned a long time ago in, uh, I guess I can't remember which, what lesson it was we studied, I think we did on Sunday morning, about righteousness. That one of the things that uh, when we come to faith and the Lord looks at us, we see the Lord's righteousness instead of our unrighteousness. But to be clothed in white signifies being righteous. The overcomers, Jesus said, will be clothed themselves in the righteousness so as not to defile themselves. In heaven, Revelation, 
Excuse me, that's the lesson we learned. It was in Revelation. Revelation 19 told us that when the church in heaven will be clothed in the righteous acts of the saints. So therefore, Dr. Jeremiah said one time, he said, if we don't have our righteous acts, like some of us might be indecently exposed when we get to heaven. <laughs> if we don't do any righteous acts, because we're clothed in the righteousness, obviously, of God, but also the things that we do for the Lord give us the righteousness. The true overcomer, Jesus says, when we get to heaven, will be brilliant in the whiteness of the righteousness that we've clothed on and the things that we've done for God. And people say, well, I never done anything for God. And Jesus told that story. Remember when you gave that cup of water to the lost soul, we invited somebody. We never know the things that we do for the Lord that will be honored in heaven that today we look at like, well, that ain't no big deal. They claim they, you know, you know, they did the X and Y. But certainly, everything we do for the Lord certainly will be rewarded one day in heaven. And Jesus says to this church, to you who are overcoming, you will be clothed in the righteousness of white and heaven. The other thing he says, they would not be blotted out of the book. Now there's all kinds of different things. And that's what, several of the commentaries really make a lot of sense on this. That ancient cities used to keep registers of their citizens. Now if you were born, who, I don't know who we would say, whoever the head of Williston would have a big book. Anybody who was ever born in Williston in this book. Now in the ancient days, the names were written in it. If you were convict, convicted of a crime or were punished, your name was taken out of that book. A sort of punishment for what you did. Or differently, if you did something very good, we say maybe Jordan was elected president, they would put her name in gold, making it bigger, showing that she was an important in this book of registry. All kinds of different things about it. I, I really like that idea. Uh, an overcomer, as Jesus says, names would be written in that book of life and never removed. So it's a promise to those faithful. Because remember, there was a little remnant here in the church at Sardis who was holding out in the midst of everybody else just walking through the motions and walking around like dead. Jesus says, to these who hold out will be dressed in white in righteousness and your name will never be blotted out of that book in heaven. And the third thing he says, I, and this is kind of a personal thing from the Lord, I will confess your name before the Father. The Bible says oh, in Matthew 10 that if we confess Jesus before men, he will confess us before the Father. And that's pretty much the last promise that Jesus makes to those who overcome here in this church at Sardis. To those who are, well, we've been working hard and have a look. Well, there's eight or nine of us in here and nobody else seems to care. We're going to give up and go our way itself. Jesus says, no, for those who hold fast to the end, I will confess you before the Father. And our names will be clothed, be written in the book of life, will be clothed in righteousness, and I will confess you before the Father. Such a sweet spirit that the Lord gives. Well, we ask a question. Now that we've been talking about the problem with the church at Sardis is how did the church die? Well, we can rule out certain things that we've learned from the previous churches. We can rule out that a church will be killed by an outside enemy. Because certainly look at the church at Smyrna. It was persecuted. It was being driven by just all kinds of things that were going on there. And that church was thriving. History shows that it's impossible to kill a church by external force. Look at all the churches in the third world, the, the voice of the martyrs right to, and the, I can't think of the other letter that we get sometimes that talks about it. Those churches are thriving even though they're suffering from persecution. This church at Sardis was not dying from persecution from the outside. Usually persecution makes a church grow stronger and grow in faith. So we can rule that out. We can rule out the death of the church by suicide. There was no meeting of the board of uh, elders or the administrative council said, we therefore say that the church is dead. There was, this church didn't take a vote and decide, hey, we're going we're to die. We've never done it. We've never heard of a church deciding to kill themselves or ruled out by abandonment. This church was certainly not abandoned by the Lord. We know that because we said there was a remnant there who was holding to the faith and allowing the people to grow. So truly, as we've mentioned earlier, what really causes churches throughout the world and the nation to die? The truth is that it dies 
as we mentioned earlier, through the death of its individual believers. Certainly a church is like a human body that when cells get sick and die, it, the body starts to deteriorate. That's the same way it is with churches. When members of the church begin to spiritually die, the church suffers. Just like Paul would say, we're like a body. Can't have a good functioning body without a good ten toes and ten fingers and two eyes and ears and all that. Church died. This church was dying through the individuals. This church was dying because it was relying, just as the city of Sardis did, on its past reputation. I love this quote. Sardis isn't the only church to have lived on its laurels. But you can only do that for so long. Vance Havner used to say that spiritual movements go through four stages. A man, a movement, a machine, and then a monument. The church at Sardis had already been through a man who set the church up. It had gone through the movement. It had been a machine, and now it was becoming a monument where it was slowly but surely letting itself die through overconfidence and the lack of discipline and all the things that we just talked about. This church was on its way out, and the Lord's given them what they need. The last thing he says, the church dies because it's not sensitive to its own spiritual condition. The church at Sardis was a lot like one of the Old Testament guys that we love to talk about. Remember big old Samson? The church was not even conscious that it was losing its spirituality. It was just going through the motions. Well, it's Sunday, we need to be there, we need to do this and that. They had lulled themselves to sleep over the years and didn't realize that, hey, we need to do something here. Good old Samson in the Old Testament, remember he went that day after she cut his hair and tried to break the bands that held him and the quote was, he didn't know that the Spirit of the Lord had departed from him. And this church had gotten a lot like that. You know, we don't lose those things that they give us. They, they, lose, they go slowly but surely by compromise, toleration, and ultimately to the point that things begin to fade out. And the Lord says, repent, return, and restore, just like He said to all the other churches. The time period that this was, was around the 1500s, up until the last 12, 13, 14, 1500s, right before the Reformation when um, who was it? Martin Luther went and nailed those theses to the wall. He began to see the deafness of this church and had, it had to repent and come out of it. And certainly we are benefits that today as now the Protestant Reformation came from that. And now... They had broken away from the deadly rituals of what had been going on during that time period. As we did, Ludwig did not, did you know, archaeologists have discovered that there was an ancient Roman, what they called a basilia, which was like a little church that was in Sardis that had been turned into a Jewish synagogue in the third century. It had a large size and indicated that the Jewish community that was located in Sardis must have been very large and prosperous if influential enough, obviously, to cause hardship not only to the Christians there, but we know that all through that Acts, it was a lot of the Jewish people that was causing hardship to the Roman church. There was a bishop named Melito there who was what became one of the prolific authors of Christian apologetics. Now, I never got into apologetics. I remember good. Lynn's listening. Mark used to talk about wanting to teach apologetics. It's kind of too deep for me. I let Mark do those things. You know, we come in and we stand and we stand on different forms and we give a defense for everything. But he was one of the early leaders of Christian apologetics, a guy named Melito, and people that are really steeped in apologetics. He even got his start here. And then this large Christian basilica later was constructed in the fourth century and had had a lot of bishops that come from it through the churches. And the seat that was there until the 14th century when the Turks destroyed it. So we see this church obviously never died. It must have repented and turned and became a strong church that was in existence up until the Turks. Now, I don't know if there's a church on that city today. I'm not sure. Next week, we'll take a, a breath of fresh air and come to one of the great churches that there is and there's a city in the United States named by that today. A city by the name of Philadelphia. So this will be a great church that we will see next week who will give us a little breath of fresh air away from the deadness. Now I told the story a couple of weeks ago 
when we were talking about this church coming, would you want your church named Sardis? I mean, you might take up on the board, we say, we're changing the name of the Williston Methodist Church to the Williston Church, no, the Sardis, Sardinian Methodist Church. Somebody obviously didn't read Revelation. You certainly wouldn't want your name, church name Sardis. I was on, the, I obviously remember on my way to Chapel Hill many times, and right before you get to Raleigh, there's a sign that says Sardis Baptist Church next right. And it was there the last time I looked at something. Maybe it fits that idea that I don't know why anybody would want to name their church the Sardis Church after what we just talked about it. But hey, they did. Anyway, it's always amazing what people will name their church. It's great. Father, we just come to you once again. <clears throat> Thank you for giving us the opportunity to understand your word. And Lord, we pray that just as the church at Sardis had that little remnant that met together in small groups to keep the church going, Lord, we pray that that our church and all the churches around us will continue to keep that remnant going, <clears throat> to keep our churches moving in the right direction, that you bring life. And Jesus said, I have the Holy Spirit, that we welcome the Holy Spirit, not only here, but all the churches that we are acquainted with and friends with and have members to go there, that the churches would grow as we move into 22, because that is the way that we keep the church going, is through the Holy Spirit and his invigoration of the church as a whole, but certainly as, as an individual as well. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.